I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guests, former Imagineers Jeff Burke and John Olson to the show. Welcome you two. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a while for us to put together. I know we've been working on it. And I also want to thank Katie Olson, who is also on the call. So, Katie, thank you so much for helping us with this, too, and for the photos that we will be showing during the interview. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for having us. And and today we're, we're continuing my interview series, one uh, of my favorite attraction at Epcot. I think I have a little bit of an unhealthy obsession with it, honestly. And... <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, I really, I, I really couldn't be more excited and honored because this is basically, if if I'm not if if I'm not mistaken, one of the official reunions of the two brothers from the show, and I think that that's one of the segments that really sticks in everybody's minds every time they see it or talk about it. So, for both of you, Jeff and John. Uh, I this is just so exciting. First of all, and <laughs> I I am kind of nervous, so uh, bear with me. But I do want to mention to our listeners. So Jeff, you got to play the Union brother, correct? I did. I uh, that that was the part that um, eventually, after um, uh, some conversation with Rock with Rick Rothschild, who was the supervising producer on American Adventure. Um, I did not know that what part was assigned, but he contacted me because we were in, or I was at that time, um, I'd moved into concept design, and so um, I had my hands full with Kitchen Cabaret for the Land Pavilion, not only doing designs, but building a scale model of. So Rick Rick got in touch with me. He said, I know you're working on other things for Epcot, but I have a proposition for you. How would you like to be in the American Adventure? Randy Bright was was in charge, um, and I, I knew that, that there was just lots going on with that, but I was not familiar with the individual's sequences and and segments um, of it um, until Rick contacted me and there was no script he didn't show me like any um, uh, storyboards or um, really any artwork he, he it was all going into uh, what the total project was about and then what part or how I would be involved in one sequence of it. And, and at the time that we first spoke, he just said, it's a Civil War sequence, would you be interested? And that was pretty much it. And he said, oh, by the way, he said, and do you know a fellow by the name of John Olson? And I said, yes, I do. I worked with him in the model shop at, um, at Imagineering. And um, he said, well, he's going to be your brother. And that was pretty much the extent at the, at the beginning um, of my introduction to what would eventually become the two brothers sequence in the show. And, and John, John, you get to play the rebel brother. So how, how did... Did Rick also contact you, kind of similar to what Jeff did, or? Yes, I think it was very much similarly. And at the time, I'd been living in Florida. And so, for me, it was like a walk-on. No big deal. I could even talk like the boys. <laughs> <laughs> but I worked with a, um, our partner company, Buena Vista Construction, and they were all real Southern um, gentlemen. But boy, they had accents, and and I learned to pick up quite a bit of that from the boys. So, from some of the emails, to Katie, that you were sending, that there was this look that it sounds like both of you had. We we needed to make sure. I guess they needed to make sure that they, we could differentiate between the brothers and their facial features and who they were. 
So what was that process like when they were kind of dressing you up, basically preparing you guys to look like particular individuals from that time period? Well, the the photograph I sent you this morning, I think rather um, it clearly illustrates that probably one of the reasons John was chosen was because of his mustache. So which is <laughs> was uh, really quite, um, I think, quite in period. But uh, I, John went through quite a process from the headshots on through the sculpting process, um, just for the audio animatronic figure. That that was quite the quite the production. That so many so much work went into those figures. Um, that you know, unless you worked at WDI like you know Jeff and John and I all did, you didn't realize how much work went into the fabrication of a figure that is even only seen for what 30 seconds or 20 seconds in the show mm -hmm. really quite an amazing investment in the process how how was the sculpting done can you kind of take me through that process uh, that, was, that, was, that was pretty amazing because um i i was working uh in in terms of this model for for kitchen cabaret i was working with the sculpting studio um, on making some of some of the maquettes and getting the full size figures done, but I had no idea that I would be uh, seated on a stool, um, and um, the sculptor that would be doing um, my facial bust and, and likeness was um, the legendary uh, Blaine Gibson. And it, it was it was pretty awesome uh, being in that studio at Imagineering and looking up at the shelves of all the plaster casts of, of all the presidents that he had sculpted, uh, the pirates that he had sculpted, all, all of this work. Um, there were heads, plaster heads uh, on shelves. And... All Blaine said to me was just please hold very still so I can um, get your likeness uh, as best as possible because you're going to become part of a full uh, standing activated uh, audio animatronic figure, uh, but all we need is your head. The other body parts are going to be fabricated um, at MAPO. Our, our production um, facility. And um, that was a pretty awesome um, afternoon. I remember sitting there and thinking, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm going to be part of this legacy of presidents, pirates, and who knows what all that, that blame over the years um, with his incredibly talented uh, sculpting gifts. There were other sculptures, but Blaine was the standout. I think um, I went in. I think we were separate, Jeff. I, Perry Russ yeah. did me, and uh, they had to get them done in record time, so they had to work right. concurrently. And it was uh, to get the show ready to go. So it was really pretty fun. And when they dressed me up looking like a Southern soldier and Jeff like the Northern soldier, my parents went, "You're from Minnesota. What are you doing down there?" <laughs> One, one thing, Tammy, that you have to understand is that because al although Rick uh, Rothschild very capably explained the nature of the sequence and, and the dramatic effect of it, but I don't believe that John or I, because different elements of it were done piecemeal, the sculpting, the photography... Uh, that was done by Gary Kruger, the Civil War uh, photography of of Matthew Brady. American Adventure Team had done incredible amount of research and pulling photos, and so uh, everything that shows up in the ultimate sequence. Um, I don't know if you were aware, John. I I just wasn't aware of all the background research that they had they had done to try to match uh, the look that finally appears in the show, to, that it would have a, a, a historical basis. 
on on Brady's photos. And Gary Kruger is just, first of all, he's the nicest guy, but he is a really accomplished photographer. And it's due to him that we were able to take on that look after, of course, as John mentioned, uh, both of us were fitted for our uh, respective uniforms. Uh, we also, this was uh, Disneyland's costuming crew, the supplier of, of all of these things. These weren't made from scratch, but we went to um, a Hollywood institution called Western Costume, and that's where we were fitted for both our, our Missouri farm boy sort of Sunday go to meeting outfits, as well as for our um, our Civil War uh, uniforms. Well, to speak to that, I was at one of the first time I saw the American Adventure show. I was sitting with a friend in the theater, and um, I knew my husband was part of the show, but I had never seen it. And then that that shot flashes up where he's blown up by the cannonball, and I almost started to cry. I was like, he looked really dead. <laughs> I mean, really yes. dead. But um, Gary, I spoke with Gary the other day and asked if he would like to participate with the, with this chat. And he said that he has taken so many, literally millions of photographs that he didn't really know how much he could chime in with. But he did want to state that he remembered shooting the outdoor shots of John and Jeff. Um, uh, they, those were shot at the Disney Studios back lot. And I reviewed the show this morning, the American Adventure show. And I think, uh, yes, the train station where John's in the box at that point, um, I think that was shot at Disneyland. That's the Disneyland trans train station in, in Frontierland. Frontierland. In Frontierland. It all meshes well together. And I think, again, I think it's another reason that people m immediately go to that sequence is because it's so emotionally jarring. Because, you know, you get this buildup of great things happening and then you, you have this sequence, you know, with Frederick Douglass first talking about slavery, which is something I, I would only assume that, you know, a lot of people don't like to touch because it's a very sensitive subject. And then leading it into this family who is separated. I think a lot of people forget that many families were divided and many people were hurt and killed and it was such um, a really horrible time for America to be against one another and I think people don't really realize that. No, I probably not. I remember uh, John actually sent me, a. they used to sell postcards, didn't they, at Epcot? They had a yeah. postcard, they actually showed, uh, I think they, they sold it in one of the shops out there and it was the postcard of, of that shot of John laying and, you know, blown up by a cannonball. You know, Tammy, that that uh, that one day that was set aside where they arranged for us to do the photo shoot um, on the back lot, which that section now is, is parking lots and all paved over. But at that time, there was quite a bit of... of uh, greenery and, and trees and, and some rolling hills where they could actually stage um, the Union encampment that uh, Gary took photos of me in, in front of and, and then also a Confederate encampment to just establishing shots to show that, that yeah, we were indeed um, a part of, of this national conflict but when we were actually on the lot i hate to say this but it was it was kind of fun i mean it was like a uh uh gary was taking pictures like a fiend i mean he was just um i i don't know how many photos they must have gone through to find the final ones that they used but um but it was it, it was kind of a, a fun day away from the other things that we were focused on um, working on Epcot, we had no idea the dramatic impact that with the photo selection and then the addition of the ballad of Two Brothers, what an emotional impact that would have on the audience when that sequence came up in the show. I remember the first time I saw it, they were doing a run-through, and I was doing installation over at the Land Pavilion, 
and I got word that uh, the sequence was being um, staged and scr- and so forth, and it was pretty far along, and that was my my first taste, and it was like, wow, that's that's what came of what we did with a few photo sessions and 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 playing soldier dress up. Um, it it had a whole other impact. They were trying to get this in early enough that they could put the show together for the opening. And uh, right. and so we, we were, I think I was working on Big Thunder, and it's like I'd work in the morning over there and then run over and, and do some kind of a session with this and then run back to Big Thunder. And, and, you know, between the two times, if I could have had a shower or two, it might have made a difference. <laughs> Rain, <laughs> I do remember, John, that you were back in Glendale for the family, uh, for that formal family shoot with our ma and, and our pa and then the, the, the little sister and the little baby and then you and I standing side by side uh, first in like our civilian costumes. The reason I remember that so distinctly is because, as I mentioned, we kind of had fun with with the shoot on on the back lot at uh, Disney Studios. But um, as it turned out, when they assembled this cast of of the mom and the dad, this Missouri family, and, and John and I as brothers, the one girl they hired from the outside well, no, the the girl and the baby, our little sister, and and the tiny baby, a, a gal by the name of Louise Hirschberg, who was from Interiors at at um, Imagineering. She, it, this photo was being taken because it was supposed to be our our ma's birthday, and this was her birthday photo. But I I have to tell you that she had her hands full. Because that little baby was anything but uh, camera ready. She wanted to be down on the floor. She wanted to be here. So Gary told, I, I remember him stating after we found out that, that the baby wasn't going to hold still very easily. He said, okay, the rest of you guys, you have to just stay frozen because when we finally get the baby squared away, and Louise was holding um, the baby on her lap, um, and so we all had to, like, hold our breath every time he shot, just in case. I don't know how many photos he must have taken that that maybe the, the baby was squirming or what have you. Um, but that that was that was a real feat for... <laughs> Gary Kruger to get that that final shot that we see in the show. Well, I think we were all squirming. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never been yeah, so. Yeah, we probably were. I've never we probably been were. so self conscious in my life, and I started sweating, and they kept blotting my face off, and and I, and the makeup had run, and I'm, I'm like, I've never worn makeup. I don't know how to do any of this stuff. And they go, just yeah. sit here. don't move, don't move. Right, right. Tammy, I sent you the, the, a picture that John had in his files of them standing there while they're touching up the makeup of the paw, and Gary's in the shot, what, getting ready to get, try and get this shot off. He looks very, very patient um, in this photo I sent you. I was just going to mention that since you guys brought it up, and I'll, I'll be showing it on the screen while everybody's listening and tuning in on the YouTube channel. But if you, yeah, if you look at this picture, you could see that the the eldest sister, <laughs> who's probably about like five or six, is kind of managing the little one, <laughs> and it's it's like right. so cute to kind of get that like outlook of. <laughs> what's what's going on behind the scenes to take the photo <laughs> yeah that that was a, that was a challenge um and um i believe that was that was shot in the warehouse at um imagineering where they they took uh dubatine curtains and and sectioned off an area and then had us 
on on the platform with with the period uh, furniture and and so forth. Well, I remember having makeup put on me, which I'd never had done before, and the lady kept puffing my face to to um, even things out and all. And I'm like, um, this is this is not what I. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, I'm kind of a surfer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, continue on with the makeup story because I, to me, the the real knockout is your look as as a fallen soldier. Um, didn't they have to do uh, some makeup? Um, on you in that particular shot when we were at the studio? Yeah, when I was laying on my back and the, the makeup lady came in and started brushing my face and and um, adjusting my uh, costume and everything else, I'm kind of like, I've never in my life had something like this done to me and I wasn't quite certain how to make of it. And I kept peeking out <laughs> and going like, what is she up to? What's going on? <laughs> And I, not not to go back to the same photo, but I just want to ask, do you know if the two little girls were related to anybody in Imagineering? Because long story short, when Ali Olmo, who sings the song Two Brothers, and I were, were at Disney World almost a year ago together to perform the song, we were at the last showing of the American Adventure of the night, and we stayed at the very end because we told the cast members who she was, and one of them said that a couple years ago, the eldest sister arrived at the show, and she said to them, she said, well, this is who I am, and I was there at the, at the shoot, and she had asked them if she could take a picture with herself and the audio animatronic of herself. And they said, well, we can't run the show and then stop it because then we have to run the whole show and it just doesn't work that way. But they said she had come in, but they didn't know who she was. And I didn't know for sure if maybe either one of you knew about that. I believe um, that Rick uh, stated that both girls were, um, I don't know if they went through central casting or what have you, but to to the best of my knowledge, uh, neither one of them were related or part of um, Imagineering, uh, you know, extended families or something like that, that they actually did cast, you know, looking through through books like you would for a movie um, and, and contacted an agent and, and so forth. Um, it was it was the four adults who were all employed by, and they got us for free. <laughs> so um, I I really don't know um, other than I, I I recall Rick saying that they had to cast um, our our two sisters, the the five year old and and the baby. Jeff, do you recall? I think they had to pay us a dollar each just for the SAG. Oh, that's true. Yeah, just for release. You're right. You're yeah. right. Yeah. I got a whole buck, and I, I and it well, was one a, of my bigger one of my bigger checks from Disney. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I kept it. I wasn't going to cash it. <laughs> I have no idea where it's gone, but. And that might be a part of their resume if it still exists. I, I was just wondering because, holy cow, would that be crazy? Because if you think about it, the baby is 40 years old now and the little girl would be 45. Yeah. Well, they, yeah. you know, whenever they would sculpt uh, one of – they always were using us for, for, for shoots – uh, I we all worked in the model shop for so many years. There's a picture, of, a rather famous picture of me. I was the lead painter on the Kitchen Cabaret on Jeff's show, and there's a wonderful picture of me that Gary took painting Mr. Ham. And uh, they re recycled John's figure into uh, the Norway Pavilion because he actually uh, is um, not Norwegian, but he certainly looks Scandinavian. <laughs> So they, they uh, <laughs> wow. he was standing on the prow of a ship in one scene of the original show at the Akershus Castle in the Norway Pavilion at Epcot. 
Jeff, you had said that both Ma and Pa, they were both a part of the Disney company. And I think you said that Ma was in exteriors. So what did Pa do? And do you believe that are, are either of them still alive? Or have you did you stay in touch over the years, either of you, with them? I have not uh, stayed in touch with them. I, I did know uh, Bob McCarthy at the time because he worked in special effects. And the special effects team uh, in-house at Imagineering um, was uh, it wasn't like a huge department. Um, everybody seemed to have their specialty, and um, and then Louise Hirschberg um, was uh, in interiors, and I I was. I did not know her personally, but I I I had said hello uh, because of friends of mine who are in the interiors department. So it wasn't like we were total strangers when we showed up for for that family shoot um, that where we're all looking so stiff and and and, <laughs> and so forth. Um, but but yeah. Bob was from special effects, and uh, Louise was from interiors. Well, the problem is, Jeff, you went north. I went south. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, That's you, true. You wouldn't answer my letters. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, Things were kind of sprung on us for that one photo shoot to the studio sort of at the last moment, because as I say, I never saw a script. I never saw storyboards, but this... Rick had it all very well mapped out in his mind. He knew exactly the looks. Plus, they had done all this research with the Matthew Brady photos, and they wanted to emulate those as as close as possible so that it really rang true, as it does in the sequence. It, it, you mentioned, Tammy, that you thought they were, they were taken from you know, like historical shots. Well, they were based on historical shots, um, and one of the shots had a Union soldier on his steed with his sword at his side and so forth. And that, so that was like one of the poses that at the last minute, uh, I remember Rick said, uh, how well do you do with horses? And I said, well, what do you have in mind? And he said, "Well, I just need you to get up, up in the saddle on this horse for, for a pose." And um, the the stallion was a little bit skittish at first, but he said there was a horse wrangler there on set, as well as a whole lot of other uh, folks behind the scenes. And he said, "Just." Just stroke his nose, stroke his back, and then we'll get you on up in the saddle. And uh, I don't think his name was Thunderstruck or, or you know, some something, you know, terrifying like that. Uh, and the scene t- turned out fine, and uh, I didn't have to do any... Uh, uh, horse stunts or <laughs> or galloping around the back lot. So it was pretty much a still as well. The horse is real. It it in the photo it looks like it could be a taxidermied horse. It's not. It's a real horse. What about the sequence, John, when you are you're posing at the camp? Were they other imagineers behind you in that sequence? I think those were studio extras which could have been Disney, but I think they were extras. And uh, I I was not at all prepared to, you know, educated to do something of that nature. But they said, just go out there and and look natural. (laughs) I went out there and I uh, (laughs) kept kept mopping my brow. They're going, you're sweating, you're nervous. I said, oh, oh, no, I've never done this. And it was it was a pretty warm day, but it wasn't wasn't excruciating. It wasn't like Florida, but uh, it was pretty neat. And you know, Gary was taking pictures of million shots a second, but uh, I, I still felt very self conscious standing there like that. And when I 
sent the pictures like I, I think I mentioned of me being dead to my mother. She just went hysterical. <laughs> oh my God. But, but yeah, you know, we got these photographs of ourselves and, and it was the kind of thing you sent to all your friends. Well, yeah, I would do it too. If, I, if I'm an audio animatronic and I'm in an attraction at Disney, you bet your bottom dollar I'm going to be sending that to every single person. My question <laughs> was, which one's the real me? And they always pick the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other picture, John, you got to finally pose with your audio animatronic. <laughs> yeah. And like I say, my mother couldn't tell which was which. <laughs> no, I don't think that's true. <laughs> Jeff, did you get a picture with yours too? I did not. I did not. I I um I checked like with Rick and he said, Well, we'll see if we can do something. But it was kind of like what you mentioned with the um the younger sister where Whenever I would show up or I would contact him, I said, and he said, well, why don't you come on by and we'll see if we can get you up on the set. And then they started running some more tests. And um, he said, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, we don't want you crunched behind the scenes because I got a really great tour uh, to see how all the scenery moved around. It, it was like a rail yard. It I mean, it was just, it was just incredible how these these big set pieces would move in and out, and you did not want to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And so uh, Rick said, "Well, I promise you, I'll get you over here." And somehow we just we never connected that way. So, dear Disney, we would like to make this happen, even if it's forty years later. <laughs> If you can hear us, <laughs> that would be cool. I, I, and it's so interesting. It's like you, th there's really not any more merchandise of the attraction anymore. You know what I mean? They only have that, like the shop next door, but it has nothing to do with the attraction more so like, you know, books about the presidents and, and that type of thing. And so that that was always a big bummer for me. I always was like, I want to, I want to get some more memorabilia from this ride. You know what I mean? This attraction, and uh, and I hope I get to take that tour. Apparently, they have the tour opportunity that you can do at Disney, and it ends in Epcot with this attraction in particular. And I've heard amazing things. I've only seen like segments from the documentaries that they made in '82, where it kind of shows how it works, but man oh man like it's it's pretty huge i think a lot of people don't realize how big it is it's humongous downstairs i think they said that the basement's bigger than the stage <laughs> it's absolutely uh gigantic and it it's really a testament to um to the imagineering uh engineering that was going on at that time when you consider that was like 40 years ago um just think of like any um, major, maybe like Cirque du Soleil uh, setup that would be like in Vegas or something like that, that has huge set pieces moving on and off. That was the kind of thing that was in the basement. Um, it, it was enormous, and all of this was computer controlled. Hey, Jeff, I think uh, when they were first doing the TNA on it, one of us sprung a hydraulic leak. It was like all of a sudden I went down to my knees. Uh, my figure went down to my knees, and and there's oil all over the stage. <laughs> and people are looking for well, the. See, well, let's see. That's what happens when you take a light uniform and you head to the Confederacy. Because <laughs> uh, I I also, uh, uh, as I was informed later, my figure sprung uh, plenty of leaks, but. With the dark navy, um, nobody seemed to be able to tell um, <laughs> until like, they removed the costume. <laughs> it's except for the technicians trying to walk up and slipping in it. <laughs> oh, my gosh, yeah, because that oil is so slick, yeah. Definitely. Exactly. It's so well held together, and it's probably one of the only 
only attractions from opening day that has remained untouched overall. Like, you know, obviously they're going to have to clean up some things and fix some costumes and update some things, especially the montage at the end. But everything else in the right. show is really untouched. Oh, it is. And it, which is, which is uh, you know, headed up by Randy. But there were, there were so many people involved with that thing. And they were breaking new ground in terms of, of not just uh, audio animatronic, the, the animation and making it lifelike, but, but just, just the staging of this, this huge spectacular. I, I went to a viewing in October of 82, and, and there was thunderous applause when the curtain came down. It was just, uh, first of all, people are just, the end of the show is so inspiring that there, there's there's this emotion that sweeps through the house, and then it was followed always by applause, which is really that's really a testament to the way the show was put together because there's not a live person that you're applauding, <laughs> you're applauding a, a bunch of robots, but but you just get so caught up. In, in the drama and, and the emotion of it all. It's, and as you point out, Tammy, it is one of the attractions that has a lot of changes have taken place at Epcot, and they continue to do so, but the American Adventure, um, it, with, with the exception of, of some film updates and, and upgrades and so forth, has remained uh, pretty much the same. And I'm so glad you mentioned Randy Bright again. We had his his children on the show a couple months ago. And I just wanted to know, do you guys have any stories of working with him directly and what it was like to be with him? Yeah, several times. And uh, we were so different in personalities. It was uh, actually a good mix. And he, he used to kind of sit and look at me and, He's laughing. He goes, why don't you get a haircut? <laughs> Calm down. You know, I'm working in the South. I got to look like one of the boys. <laughs> Which was just a ruse because I just like long, having long hair anyhow. But uh, no, we became very good friends. And uh, he, he was a little hard to get next to at first. But then once you understood his, because he was a writer. And once you understood his cadence, then you could you could wait out the, uh, the the subject matter and then have a good conversation. I don't uh, personally have. Um, I I did sit in on a couple of uh, of story sessions uh, that were back at Imagineering, um, but my go-to person was Rick Rothschild because he was in charge of. He, he was basically production supervisor. In fact, I think they they invented that title for him. He wasn't. Um, most people are either uh, uh, production directors or what have you. Rick was really riding herd on everything, and Randy was doing rewrites and. Um, uh, I know involved a lot with with the music that there were changes in music and management wanted this and but didn't want that and so he was he was kind of he he was Mr. American Adventure and so a lot of times he was caught up with either management meetings or um, a sponsor. Uh, ship meetings and that kind of thing. So his time was kind of at a premium, and that's why I dealt mostly with uh, with Rick. And one of the things I do ask everybody who's who's been on the show, who worked on the American Adventure, is that if you could, if they were to update it now, if you could pick another historic figure since 40 years has passed, who would you like to insert into the American Adventure? <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> Oh man, that's that's a tough one to to pick a classic like like a, a Mark Twain. You mean like a what would be the corresponding 21st century version of of Mark Twain? I I don't know that 
because things have sped up so, and especially now, I mean, with the Internet age and, and how, how rapidly things change, I don't know that we look to a single person as representing um, in, in spirit, I, I don't mean like a politician or anything like that, but somebody like Twain in spirit, it would be really tough. I mean, for maybe the, for the 20th century, you had Walter Cronkite, who was, he was kind of revered as, as you could trust. And, but, but news has taken such a turn and I don't know uh, Walter Cronkite would be as archaic a figure to a lot of younger audiences as Mark Twain is. So I would be really hard-pressed, Tammy, to come up with that figure that represents the, the essence, the, the spirit, the philosophy, what have you, of, of the 21st century. Well, if I can chip in, I would put Martin Luther King on that list. Well, actually, that was my pick. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were looking at each other and writing down names, and, and he took the one off the top of the list. I think Martin Luther King, with especially the way our country has um, has changed so much and so quickly, that Martin Luther King would be a, a voice of, of where we've been and where we're heading. Oh, you know, and I forgot to ask, you both didn't provide the voices of your characters, did you? Or did they no. have you come in to record at some point? No, that that was uh, that was all dubbed. At least mine was. I I, I don't know if, if you got a little money under the table to do your voice, John. Oh yes, but I changed my voice and I uh, did the inflection. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. neither one of us were were um, narrators of any kind, and so they would overdub us, and I, I don't recall who they used. I tell you, that's not John's voice, I, or Jeff's voice, when I listened this morning. I heard one thing that <laughs> that Jeff whirls and calls John a Johnny Reb, but what did you call him? Something, <laughs> oh, he was some you were kind squabbling of, on the stage. Some kind of northern. <laughs> <laughs> Blue <guy. laughs> did, did you guys get to meet any of, of the other cast members, even voice cast or in-person cast? Because I know they did a couple extra pictures, I think, for other different things. I think I met a few people at the studio. Um, really don't know who they were at the time. Didn't know, rather. And um, don't recall who they were either. But, um, you know, Jeff and I came from the same background out of Imagineering. And so we were kind of over there looking around going like, wow, this is studio work. This is, wow, look at the cameras. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> you, start, you start perspiring and going like, do I look okay? And then come up and mop your face off and a little more makeup. And it was, it was pretty interesting because uh, playing the two opposite roles put us in a um, conflict so to speak, for the storyline. And it was it was interesting because we both looked like we came from, uh, I came from the South and Jeff came from the North. And it was uh, well well cast. And I think Randy did a great job at that. I think uh, another um, facet of, of the American adventure, just as, as being a participant to the degree that I was and, and that John was, is um, how, um, as John pointed out, Randy uh, Bright was basically a writer, and he wanted, he did multiple, multiple drafts of, of the script. And, of course, uh, uh, Marty Sklar, um, heading up creative at uh, Imagineering, was also a writer. And I think they had many sessions of of going over it and how to distill and how do you select from this many years of, of American history who who are the voices, who are the people that need to speak for different eras uh, going forward. 
I it, it it's one of those things where and I and I do apologize to our listeners because you know Jeff and John have done a lot more, including Katie at Imagineering, and I I really wanted to focus on the brothers today because I thought that this is such a rare conversation and a wonderful perspective into into what you guys got to experience at that time and something that so many people refer to online. You know what I mean? I there's so many Disney fans <laughs> that I know probably did like a high pitched scream when they found out that this was going to be released, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, it, it's something that we all kind of admire and, and always, you know, reference, you know, online and, and, um, and yeah, it's, 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 it's been 40 years and there's so many, I, I know there are going to be a few listeners who were always big fans of this attraction. Is there anything the three of you would like to say to them before we kind of wrap up our conversation today? Well, for, I'd for like my... to, uh, I'd oh, like yeah. to jump in first and say that even though John decided to go with the Confederacy, and I thought he was nuts. Uh, The true fact of the matter is um, John and I were both colleagues in the model shop, as I think has already been mentioned, at Imagineering. Um, But we are not mortal enemies. (laughs) Um, At that time and to this day, we are still um, very good friends. Best friends. (laughs) There you go. We've, Tammy, we've all known each other for so long. I mean, John started in 1974. I started in 1975. We all started about the same time. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're about old friends, it's kind of literal now. <laughs> yes. But, Jim, yeah. one side light is when we were all, you know, we were all so young and, and we were all working, you, you would work sometimes two o'clock in the morning. I was a model painter. Uh, working with the uh, with the crew in the model shop, and there would be times when you would work until two o'clock in the morning to literally get a set, uh, a model of a set piece done and bought off by John Hench and Marty Sklar, and you'd you'd get you know go to bed two three o'clock in the morning, get up and go back to work at eight o'clock in the morning and start another scene. And I remember I was never worked I never worked on the American Adventure, but we were all as Imagineers, so stunned by the new technology they were trying. That was, for us, was a big, the big focus was the fact that there was going to be an audio audio animatronic figure that was going to walk. That was the very first time. And the, what is the Will Rogers uh, figure that twirls a lariat? That had never been done before. So the American Adventure broke a lot of ground in so many ways. I can't thank you guys enough for being able to do this and join me on the show because the, the, this was these were questions I had for twenty years now, and I got them answered. So, <laughs> little five year old me is like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> so I really want to thank you guys so much. This has been such a a real honor for me, and uh, you know, I I think uh, we made history today to reunite the two brothers after so long. So thank you guys so much. Well, thank you. Thank you for my brother and myself. Tammy, I mean, thank you for hosting this. This is, this is, uh, it's been a while in, in getting the reunion together, but it has been definitely worthwhile. All on a beautiful morning. Ain't nothing gonna ruin today. We're all together. That's what counts.